Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings and my second uh, attempt at this video mainly because I suddenly remembered I need to acknowledge having hit 202 subscribers. Here, look at this. See? 202 plus 7 in the last 28 days. My god, what are you people thinking? So, um, I, uh, don't really know what to do about this other than, you know, accept the fact that people actually seem to think that I am in some way worth, uh, you know, showing up for. Yes, here, here is my channel dashboard page. It's very unprepossessing, isn't it? Um, so let's move on to talking about the book for today because unlike previous times, I'm not going to do shoutouts mainly because I think I may have made some errors in my shoutouts because I didn't realize that they weren't putting them in order of arrival, but were putting them in, like, order of number of subscribers or something. Because I saw a bunch of names crop up that I'd already seen and stuff. Anyway, so uh, if anybody wants me to do shoutouts of their names for having actually, you know, hit the subscribe button, then, you know, you can show up in my comments and let me know that you feel cheated of having your half a second of not fame as I say your screen name. Anyway, I was going to be talking about The Novice's Tale by Margaret Fraser. I have started going through the Sister for Visa Medieval Mysteries because I am feeling like not having to figure out what book I'm going to read next. So for as long as I have this series, I will just be doing that series uh, because I'm feeling like I'm putting in quite enough mental work getting through uh, all six books of the Palisers, which are very, very big books. Not physically big. The copies that I have access to have, like, these just ridiculously thin pages so that you look at it and you say, oh, that's going to be about 400 pages, and then you open it up and you discover that it's actually 800. It's just the paper is so thin that it feels like it should only be 400. But it's lying. It is lying to me. So instead, I'm going to talk about Sister Favisa, um because the thing about the Sister Favisa medieval mysteries is this is a, as you can guess by her being a sister, um, this is a medieval nun who's solving mysteries. The thing about being, the thing about Dame Favisa is that she's a wonderful uh, character with sort of a couple of different important layers that make up who she is. One of which is and this was rarer than you'd think in the medieval period, she has a vocation. Uh, see, when you join the church as a nun or a monk or a priest or a whatever, at least when you're talking about, say, the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church, probably the Coptic Church too, what you're supposed to have is a vocation, that is, God has come to me in some way or other and said, I think that you need to become a priest or a nun or whatever. You need to devote your life to God, to prayers for the souls of those who cannot pray for themselves, to pray to God for all of those things that you're supposed to pray for, and you're supposed to live a life of maybe self-abnegation, but, you know, a life of, as they say, poverty, chastity, and obedience. You, uh, if you are a nun, you are known as a bride of Christ. That is, and in certain, a certain uh, nun uh, swearing ceremonies actually genuinely do have a nun, future nun, dress in an actual wedding gown because she is to be the bride of Christ. That is, I don't, I don't need a man. I have Christ there. I do not need. Uh, either physical expressions of love or the emotional connection to, I mean, given the time and place and various other things, another connection to a man, but in a general sort of sense, another romantic connection to another person of that sort of intensity that you get in a, in a marriage or ostensibly get. I am going to give up on having children, on having a romantic life, on having a life a personal life outside of the church. Uh, 
but you are also giving up on worldly things. You're giving up on stuff. Uh, this is, of course, a big deal if you are a wealthy person who has a lot of stuff. Um, it's less of a big deal if you are somebody who is poverty-stricken and already has no stuff. Uh, you know, as per Fräulein Maria in, uh, in, in, uh, the sound of music with, well, the poor didn't want this dress. Um, yes, I know I'm misquoting, but anyways, uh, you know, you have that, uh, and lastly, you have obedience. That is, you are to not merely follow the written rule of Benedict or St. Francis or whatever, uh, whatever, uh, particular branch, uh, that you're following because different different nuns and monks have different sort of schools of thought on how to be one. You have those who are entering lives of service, that is, they're, you know, the nuns who are teachers or nuns who are nurses. Um, and then you also have those who are just supposed to devote their lives to contemplation, that you become somebody who's living just off in as much of the middle of nowhere as possible and devoting as much of your life beyond the bare pragmatics of not, you know, starving to death. Uh, you devote your whole life to just contemplation. Uh, you know, different... And so that's why you have Franciscan friars and Benedictine monks and Benedictine nuns, that each of these have different sets of rules, different allowances, different things that you're allowed to have or things that you are disallowed from having, uh, you know, how much food you're allowed to have, how often you're allowed to have wine, the richness of the clothing that you're allowed to wear, and so on and so forth. These vary. Um, and anyways, uh, the point is, though, that you are supposed to follow those rules, but you are also supposed to follow the rules of your, you know, head of your nunnery or monastery, your mother superior, given in this case that we're talking about nuns, uh, you are to follow the, you know, orders of the Pope. It's kind of like being in the army in that you follow orders, you don't get to pick stuff. And so, you know, poverty, chastity, obedience, and you swear these vows, and you are to do them as gladly as you possibly can. And the theory, of course, is that, kind of like being in the army, uh, your devotion to God, your the fact that God has set you on this path is enough to make up for all of these things that you are denying yourself, kind of in the way that being in the army, your solidarity and brotherhood in arms and whatnot is supposed to make up for the fact that you have to get up stupidly early in the morning and be yelled at people with terrible haircuts. So, you have this... So, that's the idea of a vocation. Uh, but in the medieval period, there were poor people who joined monasteries for the same reason that poor people joined the army. You got your meals, you had a safe place to sleep, you were, in the case of, you know, becoming a monk or a nun, you also got some education, you would learn some Latin, you would learn a little bit of how to read stuff, you would learn some you know, some more complicated things about God and theology and so on and so forth, and it was also, again, like being in the army and getting the opportunity to go to university for free. Um, so you'd have poor people who would become members of religious orders. For that reason, you had women who were trying to escape terrible home living situations where it wasn't so much that they had a vocation as they had a I don't want to be beaten by my husband or in some cases I want the opportunity to get education I want to be in a place where I can read and write and discuss complicated ideas and think uh, things that were not always open to women um, but it was also as I said an opportunity for education but in a lot of cases you had second sons, third sons, fourth sons, third daughters, fourth daughters, people who, because of the law of primogeniture, only the eldest son could inherit. Younger sons had to figure out what to do with themselves. 
And so families would very often just sort of pack their kids off and say, oh, you're becoming a nun, you're becoming a monk. Tough luck, kid. We're going to get a tax break from the Church of Tithes because we have donated a kid to the church. And so having a vocation was much less a thing in those days. You'd sort of work yourself around to having a vocation because you didn't really have another option. But Dame Fravisa is from a wealthy family and could have become a, you know, great uh, chatelaine of a large estate. She would have been fantastic at it. She could have been a political mover and shaker in a lot of ways because she was wealthy and intelligent and a whole bunch of other things, but she had a vocation and chose to enter the church. And so that devotion underlies a lot of what she does, but at the same time, her early childhood made her into such a pragmatic person. She doesn't suffer fools gladly. She is sardonic and sarcastic, and while her position as both a woman and a nun frequently forces her to have to sit on whatever it is she's saying, she will say whatever it is she can whenever she can, and her inside thoughts are really, really cranky at times. And I love these two aspects of her, the way they come together, this this just sardonic, pragmatic woman, along with just this this very, very powerful devotion that comes through it that comes through when she takes joy in speaking the offices and comes through when she is aggravated either with herself for not being able to focus on the offices or even with just the world for intruding on them. Sometimes the aggravation, the, with the office interrupting what she's doing and her forcing herself back on track because she does take such joy in them and it's this wonderful push-pull that she has as a person. And it's contrasted very sharply in this book with the titular novice, uh, the soon-to-be sister Thomasine, who is in some ways from a similar wealthy background but in other ways is just as devoted, but as one of the other nuns says, Sister Claire suggests that part of the reason that Dame Fervisa gets so aggravated with Thomasine is that Thomasine's unworldly and, frankly, epic devotion to God is something that if Fervisa hadn't had to be so practical, hadn't had to learn to be practical, hadn't developed an internal devotion to pragmatism and functioning, uh, that she might well have been just as obsessed with holiness and prayer and and everything else as Thomasine is. Um, anyways, the novice in question is, of course, accused of a murder, and uh, because the uh, man who is doing the accusing, Master Montfort, who is the crowner, that is, the person who gets called in when there is an unexpected and unnatural death, uh, the crowd, that was the crowner's job, is to show up when there's an unnatural death and figure out what actually happened. Was it, you know, an accident or murder or whatever? And he accuses Thomasine of it, not so much because she doesn't have opportunity or motive, but because it's the easiest thing. And so Fervisa is forced to step in because it would be a grave miscarriage of justice, of, you know, truth and God's will and all that kind of stuff for them to cart Thomasine off for a murder she didn't commit, especially when it's not based on facts or reason, but just on, let's just pick somebody as fast as possible to get this over with. And so there's a lot in there of discussion of both faith and the outside world and the choices that people make and the things that they give up and the things that Thomasine isn't giving up because she honestly doesn't care. Um, it's kind of really, really sad that there's this guy who's in love with her and she didn't even notice, poor thing. Uh, anyways, uh, so again, yay 200 subscribers and I think that's everything. So I will see the next, well, you all with the next book uh, next week.